Um, my name is Kevin Ong. I am a plant pathologist, associate professor at Texas A&M, uh, and an extension specialist. I get to wear a lot of hats. Uh, the major hat I get to wear is the director of the plant disease diagnostic lab. So somebody said there that she sent a couple of samples to the lab and got back a result that says negative. You can take that to the bank that based on the sample that you got, we did not detect the virus using current genetic uh, methodologies. And we'll talk a little bit about that more because the other one thing that I get to do as a director of the clinic, we get to see a lot of different things. And also, unfortunately, we get to work with many things. Uh, I started my career with Texas A&M in 2002. Um, I was up at the Dallas Research and Extension Center in Coit Road for about uh, five years. Uh, what people might not realize was I was working with Rose Rosette in 2002, in 2003, in the McKinney area, in the Plano area. Um, it's not a new disease, and I'll go in a little bit into the history. Uh, part of what I want to try and do here is the fact that I've had a lot of people ask me questions about Rose Rosette, and, and, and I'm going to give you some disclaimers for myself. I don't only work with Rose Rosette. I work with a bunch more other things. And in fact, right now, the things that are on my plate includes palm diseases, uh, part of quarantine issues. And just yesterday, I was informed that I'll be working more on uh, bacterial leaf scorch, on pecan. Uh, again, quarantine and phytosanitary issues. Uh, those are just two things. In addition, the lab and myself, we process over four or 5,000 samples dealing with citrus greening. Thankfully, y'all don't grow too much citrus up here, and none of the uh, DFW area is quarantined for citrus greening. So there's a lot of different things that I, I, I work with. And, and Rose Rosette was kind of a little side hobby. Uh, yeah, and about, what, three years ago or so, Dr. Burns came up and said, hey, let's talk Rose Rosette. You interested? I said, sure. You know, little me thinking, yeah, he's going to ask for a big grant. Chances of that getting it, mm, slim because it's ornamental. Then we actually got the grant. And I go, oh boy, <laughs> work. And, and, and one of the things that I'm responsible for is the monitoring network. Um, breeders like to know whether they have sources of resistance or tolerance so that they can incorporate those germplasm uh, into new breeds, uh, new cultivars. Now, I'm a plant pathologist. I like sick plants, okay? Uh, so, my job here was to figure out how do we get that information um, as quickly as we can and as reliably as we can uh, for the plant breeders. And I found out the biggest problem that we have in terms of getting volunteers and getting information. Everybody comes to that information from a different source. They read different things and they have different ideas of what that particular disease may be. And in this case, it's Rose Rosette. And as such, if we were to have a monitoring system, how do we ensure that the information that we are asking from our volunteers are sound, are reliable, and trustworthy? That's difficult. So there are a couple of things that, that, that we're trying to put in place, or at least I'm trying to put in place right now, before we launch an app. Because one of the things is, it's easy to get people to enter information. It's a lot harder to find colleagues that are willing to verify those uh, reports. And when you talk about a nationwide approach, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, the other thing too, I'll be showing you a few uh, with a little bit more focus in Texas and the distribution of the disease and explain to you a little bit about uh, what I mean by what is considered positive. Now the lady that said you, you have a daughter in College Station that has rose rosette or you believe, I want the address of your daughter. <laughs> the reason is this, even though rose rosette is not a regulated disease. Which means that if I want to, I could take a rose, rosette disease plant to College Station and work with it. But 
Unfortunately, I'm a plant pathologist, so I get a bunch more eyes looking at me. And it, it would not be wise to take a disease plant into an area where disease has not been confirmed, uh, much less to be the plant pathologist who is known to introduce the disease into the area. Okay. Um, so we don't want to do that. Um, the, there are a lot of information out there regarding Rose Rosette, and you have heard a lot of different things. I've seen newspapers where I almost choke and balk, I, and I think I did get that Fort Worth uh, news that says that you know Dallas Fort Worth is the epicenter of the uh, disease. And I think I got so angry, I, I think I emailed you, I think Dave, you were the first one who got that, that forward of that email. Because, you know, in one sense, it's nice to say that it's the epicenter because it gets people interested. But what it does diminish is the fact that this is a nationwide problem. And where it's been a huge issue, believe it or not, is in the Washington, D.C. area. And so it's not a local type situation. The reason why we got a national grant is because this is a national problem. And potentially an international problem. Uh, the limitation there is, you know, why is it only heard about that it's in the United States? Why not around the world? Uh, isn't it there? Well, it could be there, but who's talking about it? We are. Uh, so that's the thing that you have to keep in mind is what you hear and what you read, you always have to qualify it with how true is it? How trustworthy is its information? Is it one anecdotal, which means that I saw something, therefore I think it is? Or is it scientific, which means that somebody actually thought they saw something and did some work on it and said, yeah, based on this little set of experiments, I say that it is Rose Rosette. Or how reliable is that information? So what I'm going to do here today, if it's a speculation, I am going to qualify that it's a speculative uh, statement. If it's a scientific statement, I will do the same. Uh, what I did too is a couple of years ago, maybe it was last year, I don't remember right now, we came up with a, a fact sheet called Rose Rosette Demystified. I had 400 copies of this made out there. If you want to take more than one, you're welcome to. This is available online at the uh, AgriLife bookstore. Um, and this was my response to a whole bunch of questions that was brought in by county agents and other specialists when they got hammered with questions like what Dr. Burns was up here with the questions that you all have. And a lot of it has scientific answers to it and logical reasons why um, uh, we do what we do and why we recommend what we recommend. So I'm going to show you a little bit about distribution and also ask for your help later on, but also address some of those recommendations and why we ask you to do um, what we think based on what, what we think is good based on what the knowledge that we know of this particular disease system right now. Now, this is a chart from a 2002 publication uh, basically showing where Rose Rosette has been reported. Now you might have s be sitting there and thinking, wait a minute, did, didn't Dave Burns just say that uh, uh, they just figured out that this was a virus in 2011 from the group in Arkansas. And in fact, it was Giannis, a, a graduate student that wrote that, that paper you know, 70 years uh, before figuring out that it was a virus. Now, this is not a new disease. Uh, it, it was reported in the 50s based on observations, um, symptom observations, so phenotypic um, uh, uh, features. Uh, back to plants that were observed in the 40s, um, first in Canada and then in Wyoming and, and, and California area. Now that being said, why did they think it was a virus? And in fact, as early as the 50s, they were already saying that it was a virus even though they could not prove it because there are certain characteristics of this disease that allows the speculation that it may be a virus. And part of it is, it can be transmitted to grafting. And 
how the disease developed. So to a plant pathologist, when they see those patterns that are consistent with what a virus can do, they suspect it's a virus. Now, in the 70s and 80s, there were a couple of other groups of folks that said, wait a minute, you know, those symptoms that we see, and now I'm not going to talk about symptoms as much because we don't have time for that, but there's a whole bunch of symptoms that are associated with rose rosette. Things from witch's broom to reddening to ex extensive thorniness and, and thickened canes. By the way, all those symptoms that is actually on the chart may not occur on one plant. It could, but it does not. And if you also notice with roses, that's another interesting part about roses. Uh, you are not dealing with one cultivar. You're dealing with hundreds of cultivars. And each one of them have their own characteristics. And so how do you, or how would a plant pathologist address the fact that you have all these different symptoms? And I, I always tell folks, the best way to think about this is when we say excessive thorniness, we mean that it is to the extreme based on that particular cultivar. Same thing with pigmentation, reddening. Extreme reddening of tissue could be a symptom if it's excessive on that particular cultivar. You know, at the clinic, we get a lot of samples in of new growth from knockouts. They, they're really nice maroons. And I'll, I'll say this, we enjoy that $35 check that we receive, <laughs> but because it's a real easy thing when we look at it. Oh, it has a few thorns, it's, it's, but the leaves look somewhat normal and it's, it's maroon. Well, maybe they're supporting us at Texas A&M. <laughs> Excellent. You know, we'll take the 35 bucks and tell them it's new growth. That is true for knockout rose, but you've got other cultivars that don't have that natural red color in the new growth. So in those type of cultivars, it could be a problem. So when we talk about symptomology, you got to think of the symptoms as being excessive for that particular cultivar. What does that make you? That makes you to do your research to learn more about that particular variety and what it does, what it's supposed to look like. Now when we talk about rose rosette disease, we are really talking about three things that are, or actually have a role, three biological entities that have a role. Number one, we have the plant. That's the rose. That's a purview of the uh, breeders. Uh, you know, I like plants, but that doesn't really tickle me as much. Now, the other two biological uh, components is what interests me the most. You have the mite and you have the virus. I'm a plant pathologist. I love viruses to a degree. They're a pain in the butt to work with because they're really small and you can't see them with the naked eye. Then you have this thing called the aerophyt mite. It's a mite. Now, I'm not an entomologist. I don't claim to be an entomologist, but I know enough that I can annoy an entomologist if I call the mite an insect. It's not, okay? The mite is actually an arachnid, so a relative of the spider. This particular mite, which I'll show you some pictures later, is really small. Um, so I want to set a few ground rules here and, and, and just some basic understanding. So you actually have three things going on, or three components there. You have a plant that can get sick and may show symptoms. You have a mite that is capable of transporting the virus from a sick plant to a healthy plant. And then you have the virus that causes those symptoms in the plant uh, when it interacts with the plant. So the thing I want you to remember is you can find the mite without the disease being present. In other words, the mite can be there, but it does not necessarily have to carry that virus. Uh, there are several other th disease systems that actually have a, a, a insect vector or a mite vector type uh, situation. And that's the hardest thing that we try to get across. Just because you see the mite doesn't mean your garden is done for. The mite is a potential carrier, but it doesn't mean that you have the disease just because the mite is present. Is that clear? Okay. 
However, what you do have to realize, if you see the mites, the risk of your plants having the disease is much higher. And so, keep that in mind. We have a virus that's pretty much immobile. We have a mite that is the carrier of the virus, can carry the virus from one plant to the next, and we have the plant that can get sick. So that's kind of a, the, the ground rules I want to lay. Okay, 2002, this are the, uh, the red spots are the, are the places where they said that they are rose rosette, and all this were based on symptomology. And by the way, you can get this online. Um, what I did was I, I called out the information for Texas and said, what do we know, at least in literature, scientific literature, in 2000 in Texas? Well, you have about six counties there that lit up. You know, you have Smith and Russ, where the uh, uh, Tyler area, where the uh, rose industry was. But you have Grayson County, Collin County, well, let me go back a little bit. Um, and then you have Tarrant County and Palo Pinto County. And all those were, again, uh, diagnoses that were made based on symptomology. Oh, I should also put a disclaimer here. When I was working with Rose Rosette, I was one of the people in the phytoplasma camp. So I didn't think it was a virus. I thought it was something else. Until Yana showed me I was incorrect. And in fact, when the first paper out, I'll also say this, I didn't believe him. Um, and in fact, he did have some good experiments later on to show that the virus does and can cause those symptoms. Um, now, this is what I would call the current map. I want to state one thing. The, oh, I'm in charge of this map, so I get to light up stuff. And the way that I light up stuff is if we get a positive confirmation genetically and from plants that have been in the ground for at least two years. And the reason for me doing that is if I get a sample from a county and the person just said that I planted this plant six months ago, I cannot tell if that virus came in with that plant when it was bought or it was transmitted there by the mite or some other source that we are not aware about yet. So placing it a two year sort of a, a, a line on it basically just gives me a little bit more confidence that that infection is truly an infection that came in um, uh, naturally and not true movement of plant material. Does that make sense? Yes. So, in, in, in this chart, what you notice in the blue is all the can now, in the red was still the 2002 uh, um, report, which we haven't confirmed further or found any other incidents uh, in regard to being able to confirm it with a genetic test. This year, we lit up uh, Wichita County and Taylor County. Taylor County is Abilene, and uh, Wichita County is up in Wichita Falls. What's interesting about these two locations is uh, the one in Abilene was on plantings that have been there for about three years. So it's been in the ground for three years and suddenly symptoms show up. Uh, the one in Wichita Falls was about four to five years uh, and symptoms show up. What interests me about all this thing is the proximity or the distance of it from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. How in the world did it get there? And you might say, well, couldn't the virus be latent that long of a period? Theoretically, it could. So it goes back to what does scientific literature says. And there's quite a number of literature um, that, that has looked at mites, look at rose rosette disease, and look at epidemiology, look at uh, etiology of the disease, how the disease develops. The shortest period in any paper that I've come across for symptoms to develop, and this was, I believe, through a grafting test, was 17 days. You take a disease, but put it on a healthy plant, 17 days later, you get symptoms. That's the sooners. Now, the, the, the longest that I actually saw that was reported was something like 230-something days before symptoms start appearing. 
So you have probably read about uh, stuff in the newspaper that says, well, symptoms could show up within the year. Is that, that's a true statement. Symptoms could show up 18 months later. That again is a true statement because there was one paper that says that they left something much longer and 400 plus days later they had symptoms. So they are both not incorrect. So we have a situation here at least on this particular disease and on the varieties that those scientific papers look at, those researchers study. We have symptoms showing up as early as 17 days and as far as 200 days on direct infection and even up to 18 months. We do have some colleagues with this project that are looking and trying to hammer that down a little bit further because there is speculation and here I stress speculation that the latency period may be due to not only environmental conditions but also to the cultivar of roses. So there may be some interaction between that virus and the rose uh, in, in how the expression of symptoms do occur. Um, the, 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 the yellow counties are basically counties that people have showed me a picture of that when I look at it I said, golly that really looked like rose rosette. But they have not sent me a sample. So it's not officially lit up. Now you will also notice that Harris County, Montgomery County, Houston area, it's not lit up. But you may have heard people saying, or even folks from the Houston Rose Society saying, we have Rose Rosette in Houston. I'm going to tell you this much. I, I had Gay Hammond one time, went out and take a look at it, and, 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 and she came back a year later and said most of what she saw was a mistaken identity, uh, probably due to chili thrips. We did have a, an incident this year where a sample was sent up to Oklahoma, to Jen Olson in Oklahoma State Clinic, where they initially detected rose rosette and they issued a report that said that that is rose rosette. So I said, oh boy, there goes Houston, no Harris County. But then a couple of weeks later, they sent a second report retracting that first report. And so I got with her and said, what happened? And as far as she can tell, they think that the technician made a mistake early on because there was a sample that lit up later and, and when they went back to the original samples that came, the samples from Harris County did not test positive. So as far as we're concerned, there's no in indication in Harris County. San Antonio, Bear County, several years ago, there was a potted plant that actually had rose rosette in it. It was found in a retail nursery. Bear County is not light up because that plant um, came from a nursery at a county that actually had rose rosette before and so we don't count that because it's not a native infection. Okay. Now the other thing that's interesting about this disease if you notice in Texas it appears to be regional along the I-20 corridor. You know what's interesting about this is you can find this disease in Shreveport not in New Orleans. In Birmingham not in Biloxi. What gives? We're still trying to figure that one out. Um, just a quick run through again. This is just kind of a, a, a quick history lesson about where it's seen, how it's seen based on reports. Now, it doesn't mean that this disease actually showed up in the 1940s. It could have been there, but nobody talked about it until the 50s, actually. Um, I'm just going to go through this real quick. Just a slight point here. 96, they said it found in Hageman Wildlife Refuge in Grayson County. I think Dr. Brand Pemberton and myself is planning to go up there at some point to see if there's still multiflora roses there that may have the disease. Uh, but the other thing too, if you notice, Hageman Wildlife Refuge is right on Lake Texoma and right across there is Oklahoma. So we blame Oklahoma for giving us rose rosette. Um, yeah. Thank you. 
So, by the way, that is speculation. <laughs> now, you, you know, it's, it's interesting. You talk about all this stuff, and, and the, the biggest question I think somebody bring up, you know, how does it move around? How does it get so bad? Um, I think, Brahm, you came up with the uh, Kreb, uh, Myrtle Bark Scale uh, incident. Now, the question is, what do people say about Rose Rosette and how does it spread? You hear different speculations. If you go back into historical documents, scientific documents, you will hear that multiflora roses was brought to this country 200 years ago. They're not sure, but they think that the mite might be, have been brought over with that plant that many years ago. That speculation that is now in a scientific paper. Did that really happen? Nobody knows for sure. And you might say, well, is it showing up in China or Asia where it is? I'm going to tell you one thing, why I'm a phytoplasma person. I work with phytoplasmas on palms and a lot of other things. It's a naked bacterium. And there had been reports of witch's broom, reddened tissues, basically symptoms that are or have been described for Rose Rosette in a report from Russia that basically says it's a phytoplasma. There's at least two reports from India, uh, Indian journals, that basically showed that it was a phytoplasma. There was a report in China that says it was phytoplasma. There was also a report in China that said it was a virus. Who do you believe? And this is all scientific papers where people actually did the work. Um, real quick about the causal agent. Uh, it's an it's a mite, an aerophyte mite, a specific type of mite, Phylocoptus fructifolus, 140 to 170 microns. And, and really, they said the, 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 the male is a little bit smaller than the female. This is an interesting part. I'm starting to learn a lot about, you know, on the entomology side of things, and this just fascinates me. The female has two sets of, uh, well, the genes and, and basically if the egg is not fertilized it becomes a male. Cool stuff. Uh, when you talk about 150 microns or so, that's one tenth. No. Is it one tenth? One one? Of one milli yeah, one tenth of one millimeter. So if you look at your ruler and say one millimeter is that tiny little space and one tenth of that, that's really small. Uh, in fact, I, I, I did annoy one of my students before I had a gal that came up to me one year and wanted to do a project. And I look at her and said, Ashley, great, you're young, you got great eyes, go pick out mites. <laughs> that, you know, that excitement easily got lost and within two weeks after she realized she was spending all the time looking in the microscope looking for this mites. Uh, they do live on new growth between leaf patios and leaf buds, and I'll show you a picture of that. And they can be dispersed by wind to neighboring plants. But interestingly, there have been a couple of papers that also describe that a great way that this mites travel from one plant to the next is by walking. So if you got your plants close together, touching each other, the mites can move from one plant to the next. So the question earlier that was about spacing. You know, with roses, that's a, if you take into account, it can walk from one plant to the next. So, realistically, you want the plants not to touch each other. And when you talk about roses, you got all different cultivars of roses. Some are bigger and some are smaller. So, what's the effective spacing? Good question. Um, it it has to be uh, dealt with the the um, the information that needs us. What does the cultivar of the rose does? On your left is a picture of the mite through uh, a microscope, a compound microscope at, at 1000x. Um, real small, tiny buggers. And on the right side is actually a picture that I took where we peeled back the leaf. So what you see here is the scar where that leaf is at the tip. And you will notice little things that look like grain of rice. That is the mite. It is small, it is tiny, and when it's nice and when the temperature is right, they can be pretty fast. So when you're looking in a microscope, you know, it, it's, it's really a pain trying to pick them off. So sometimes we cool it down a bit, you know, slow them down. 
Um, in the early 2000s, I had huge arguments with Dr. Jim Ryan, who was an entomologist at the uh, research station here uh, on Coit Road. He was working with aerophyte mites on Bermuda grass. And what happens is when you look at aerophyte mites, they can cause witches brooming. Basically, witches brooming means shorten into nodes. And, and so the, the habit of growth of that plant ends up bunching up together. There are many different things that can cause witches brew. But one thing that the entomologists have studied before on woody ornamentals, as well as grasses, aerophyte mites, and their feeding on those tender new shoots can cause those kind of symptoms. So his supposition is the mites cause the witches brooming. It's not a virus, it's not a disease, it's not your phytoplasma that you said. I said, well, that's not true. Because, you know, there's literature that says, and there's at least two scientific papers that had the work done and showed, well, demonstrated that the mites alone, the feeding of the mites alone, does not cause the rosetting symptoms that occur on roses. This was Jim Reiner's response. They don't know what they're doing. <laughs> so what that tells me is, you know, there's some of you guys out here may look at that and say, yeah, I choose to believe that, or you can say, I choose not to believe that. But the short of it is, there are at least two scientific papers out there that show people doing good work, and you would assume that they are telling the truth and not using fudge data to show that the mite itself, without you know, that supposedly clean, not coming from a diseased plant, will feed on a clean plant and resulting in no uh, rose rosette symptom. Um, this electron microscopes that I lifted off uh, uh, from, from Bugwood, some of our uh, uh, images repository, just to give you an image of what they look like. Again, reminder, this is not really an insect. It's an arachnid. It's an arthropod. Um, and they're tiny, tiny things. But they're pretty too, if you want to think of it that way. Um, all right. In this publication, EPLP10, on the back, I think the second to last page, that's a whole bunch of references. The reason why I put this together is I wanted people to get a little sense of what I was saying, but also not to just trust me wholeheartedly, even though I should be trusted since I work for extension, right? <laughs> but they, they would take the time, if there's interest, go look up those scientific publications, and there are more than just what I've listed there. And find out for yourself, and, and choose to believe which paper you want to believe. Um, in there too, we put down the current recommendations, and, and, and Dave did mention some of those. One of it is to remove, confirm, or symptomatic plants early after observation, including roots, bag, and discard, do not compost. I'm going to qualify a few things. Why do we ask people to do the things that we say? Remove, confirm, or symptomatic plants. Why? This is a virus. What do we know about viruses? When a virus infects a plant, we don't have any good solution to get rid of the virus from the plant. So that virus will be in the plant. In the particular case of this virus, we also know that it can be taken up by the mite at any time if that virus is present. We don't have a lot of information as to when the virus is present, but there are speculations and there's some anecdotal evidence that suggests that certain times of the year, the titer or the presence of the virus is a lot more in certain types of plant tissue than other times of the year. For example, like if it's dormant uh, in the winter months, they don't feel like the, uh, there's a lot of viruses in the canes, even though the symptoms may be there, but most of the virus are concentrated in the roots. And again, that's based on the type of virus that we're dealing with. So, on the basis of the information that it is a virus, we can get rid of it from it's a plant. So, if you have a virus-infested plant, get rid of the plant. 
so that it does not serve as a reservoir for other plants. <coughs> now, I'm going to throw a few things there. Some people said, well, you don't have to dig up that plant, you can just prune it. And that way, the new shoots that come out is clean. Funny thing was, in 2004, we did a test like that at McKinney. And uh, I actually got two different answers from two different plants. If the virus is not located throughout the plant, theoretically, if the virus is only found on symptomatic tissue, then you take off the symptomatic tissue, you might have isolated that virus, so to speak. That is a theory. I have several incidents where we have done that and we have looked at healthy looking canes on the same plant and we cannot detect the virus. Does this mean that the virus is non-uniformly distributed? It could be, but then again, it could be depending on how it distributed on different cultivars. But then the other thing about this particular virus is it can reside in the roots, or supposedly could. And so at different times of the year, it could come up again in the vascular system into different parts of the plants. So it can still be retained as a reservoir. Well, what if you cut it early enough and it didn't get to the roots? Then maybe you have a new plant. Uh, could be. So some people take those little tidbits and, 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 and come up with this solution of pruning, which I really don't think is wise. Because you may look at one and it, you, it, that those outcomes may occur on one or two plants, but when you look at a general viewpoint, what is a virus, what it does, and what this particular virus does, pruning is not a wise decision. It might work for you, or it might not. But if you're trying to protect a whole area, the most prudent thing in this situation is to remove the plant. And that's what we recommended. Um, the other thing too I noted here is remove the plant including roots. And the question is why roots? Well, if the virus is in the roots, what is the risk of carryover? or retention in the virus through the future. Um, the biggest fear with roots is there are a lot of roses that have the propensity to sucker. And so, if the roots are just in the ground, no suckers, whatever, the chances of it transmitting the virus to another plant is small. I, I think I read somewhere, and, and, and Dave can correct me if I'm wrong, but most roses, the roots do not graft readily like oak trees do. And so, if you say there's root grafting, then yeah, that could increase the risk of potentially um, of the virus coming in from a diseased root to a healthy plant. But if the plant does not, and I think roses do not readily graft roots, then that risk is minimal or small. The, where the risk comes in is if this diseased roots suckers, then you have a green part of the plant going up that may have that virus that could be picked up by the mite and transmitted. Does that make sense? So, based on that risk, we say, get rid of the roots. Now, the other part here is bag and discard. Why bag and discard? The mite has opportunity to escape if you don't bag it. The worst thing you can do in your garden is to cut down that bush and drag that bush across your garden because you are just spreading or allowing the mice to spread. Bag it, isolate it. Now some people have said, well, my rose bush is big. I don't have a bag that big for it. Well, some common sense would say, get a few bags, do that pruning, stick it in the bag and close it up. Minimize the amount of time of exposure for the mites to go. Now, one thing you might not realize too is the mites, you can move the mites. The mites can be on your clothing. And in fact, one way that I didn't mention uh, was that this mites uh, has also been shown in some scientific paper that they can move from plant to plant not by being blown by air, but by hitchhiking on other insects, phoretics or forcing. So, 
if you know that it could potentially be on your clothes, then logically speaking, you want to do that pruning less if you're out there in the garden, or that's the only thing you do that day. Clean up and then get in and change out of your clothes. The mite is not going to last very long on its own without a food source. Okay. Then the other thing, composting. By the way, this recommendation is given to primarily homeowners and commercial type operations uh, that does with landscape maintenance. Do not compost. Why? If you're a homeowner, where's your compost pile? I'm, and I'm sure you're not going to compost the stuff in a bag, correct? And so, if you have exposed plant parts on your compost pile, that gives sufficient time for the mite to move off to other plants. Now, I also have commercial composters ask me, people are putting their stuff in the trash and we get them. What do we do with them? And I tell them, compost it. And somebody might accuse me and say, wait a minute, you're talking out both sides of your mouth. Why do you tell them that they can compost it? This is the reason. If you're a professional composter with a facility, chances are it's out somewhere that does not have a lot of plants around it. And if they do, in fact, I do qualify that. Make sure you don't have any roses in your landscaping. When a plant material go into a professional composting uh, facility, it gets crushed up into tiny pieces. And then it gets turned, and it gets turned at a regular basis. If that composter does the job well, that plant material will turn into composted material in about two weeks. With heat, mites are not gonna survive that. Then some people might say, what if they don't do a good job and you get, have root tissue that may have the virus in it? So what? Remember I told you earlier, there's less likelihood of root grafting among roses. Chances of transmission is low. Risk management. I will not, and, and you should never tell somebody that yes, you can compost this. Because chances are if they have a compost in the backyard and want to do that, that is just a source for potential spread of the mite. Okay, uh, let's see what else do I have on here. Second thing on the recommended thing is, is saying treat adjacent plants with a miticide to reduce probability of transmission of the mites. Uh, there are a couple of options there for homeowners. Abamectin or Avid is one. Horticultural oil is another one. And I put this note, this is not, I don't believe this is in the publication. This will not stop the virus if it's in the plant. This strategy is meant to slow down the virus. And we're trying to learn more about the different chemicals that we can use and the different tactics that we can use to prevent spread of the mites from one plant to the next. Now when you talk about treatments, uh, with whether it's a conventional or natural chemical, the purpose there is to slow the spread, not stop the spread. Because if you think for a minute, you have a mite that fed on a sick plant and picked up the virus and he goes to a healthy plant that you have treated. It may or may not feed. Some products might deter it from feeding. But let's say it was hungry enough that it would feed it. Or if you treated that, that healthy plant with a systemic chemical. So that chemical that kills the mite is in the plant. Well, the mite has to feed on the plant to pick up that poison. But at the process of feeding, it could have injected the virus into that plant while picking up the poison. So it dies. Guess what you just did? You prevented that mite from going to get to another plant. But you did not stop the infection of that plant. It's a strategy to slow down spread. It's not a strategy to stop spread. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Remove any wild roses in the vicinity of cultivated roses. Now this is the interesting part. If you look back at scientific literature, uh, there are several papers that goes back I think to the 60s and 70s that, that basically look at the different species of roses and, 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 and speculated on which, based on observations, which were uh, resistant 
or non-resistant. And the consensus of that was that the wild roses is the reservoir for this virus. So even back then, the recommendation was around cultivated roses, get rid of any wild roses. Now what was interesting was there was one paper, I think I read in, that, that was in the 50s or maybe it was in the 60s that basically made the statement. Even though multiflora roses were the reservoir or speculated reservoir for this um, disease entity, we don't feel that it would be of huge damage to cultivated roses because of the proximity. Well, that has changed over those years and now we see it in the landscape. Why do we see it in the landscape? Probably having certain varieties that are more susceptible uh, to this disease in the cultivated roses and the, uh, the, the usage of this plant material in larger quantities resulting in bigger islands uh, where that virus could be and, could, and, and those islands could also be a source for those virus. Uh, the other thing I do want to state here, when I say wild roses, nowadays in urban areas, you're not likely to see multiflower roses in your backyard. But you may have the possibility of seeing escape roses. Or I would say, you know, roses that gone wild. I, I would prefer to use the word feral. You know, that, 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 you know people didn't take care of their roses and suddenly it, it goes a little bit crazy. It could be of a cultivated variety at one point. But I would say, treat those, basically wild, I put here is a plant that people didn't take care of and it's growing on its own without any cultivation. If you don't know that and you don't want to keep that and if it's on your property, get rid of it. If it's on your neighbor's property and he thinks it's a weed, hey, get rid of it. Um, so these are just little strategies to try and increase the distance between a source of disease and the plant that you're growing. The monitoring weekly for symptoms and act quickly if symptoms are observed. We recommend this because in an area where you don't have a lot of disease and there's not a lot of sources, this strategy is going to work much, much better is saying that if you notice that a plant starts showing sy symptoms and you assume that it does have the virus, you get rid of it. That means you reduce the potential of a reservoir being present in the proximity of your other plants. Therefore, a virus to come in again has to travel much further, which buys you time, and you are still trying to keep at least your area somewhat clean. I'm sad to say this, and, 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 and some of you might disagree with me, and some of you might want to kill me after this, that's okay. Dallas-Fort Worth area, you know, in early 2000, there were cases, it pops up here and there, but it was not until about five years ago where you start hearing more and more of the situation happening. And I think uh, the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens won't mind me saying this anymore. They've been dealing with this issue since the 90s, successfully. You know, they pull out the plants when they see it, they treat it with minocytes to slow the spread, and they replace plants annually. I think this is the first year that I heard that they, they are struggling to keep up with that. And the question is, why are they struggling now and why they haven't struggled before? Just imagine this, you have a problem. When the problem is small, it's easy to nip it in the bud. But when you get more and more of that virus being present in a particular area, and you also have an increasing population of mites in the particular area, it is much harder to keep out the bad stuff. Now, that being said, I'm going to tell you what my colleague in, in, in Tennessee, Mark Windham, told, told me about his management method when we talk about best management practices. So he's in charge of the roses at this garden in, 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 in University of Tennessee. And he says he puts the fear of God into his students that are helping keep the garden, that if they see any symptom that looks like rose rosette, whether it's confirmed or not, that plant is out of the ground in 48 hours. So he says more than likely they probably pull out some plants that were not rose rosette, 
but he scares them enough that if they didn't, they don't have a job anymore. Or worse still, they get a bad grade. So, he says, by doing this, they are getting rid of about 2% of the plants annually. And he says he's given a budget to refresh that garden with new plants every year. And that's about 8 to 10% of the uh, plants that get replaced every year. So he says what is happening is this disease or the speculation of this disease is causing him to change 2% or, or made the decision for him which 2% of those plants are being changed. In the long run, he says, it's a good management practice because the director of the garden does not know we have a rose rosette problem. <laughs> so you say what he did was, if I have to change 8% of those plants and 2%, the decision has already been made for me which, which plants to change. So he takes that approach in terms of, 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 of changing out plants and management. But for that to be successful, you monitor it often. Now for a homeowner, that's great because you may have a few plants out back. You can be out there watching that plant every week, every day, and when you start to see symptoms show up, you might have to bite the bullet and say, you know, that looks like rose rosette, bag it up and get rid of it so that your other plants are not affected. That's probably the best way to, to go about it. But what we do find a lot of folks do is they see that disease part, they prune it off. And they think, oh, it looks good again. And remember I told you about a latency period? Well, the latency period is when symptoms show up. But that plant is already sick. So the virus is in the plant. If the mite feeds on that plant, even though it's not showing any symptoms, it could theoretically pick up the virus, right? So that's kind of the way uh, to, to, to look at some of this and, and, and why we recommend uh, what we recommend. Now, how you can help. If you get or hear of sources from counties that were not lit up on the Texas map, I would like to know. Uh, and if you get samples, if you are a hobbyist and grow some funky varieties, I would like to know too. And I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way. I don't want knockouts. I don't want drift roses. I don't want some of the uh, earth kind roses because I know which one gets it. But if you have some weird varieties that you think we might not have, contact me. Uh, you can email, shoot an email to roses at sickplants.org. They'll get to me. And, and, and what I would like is, you know, just a snapshot of it. Um, this is temporary right now because eventually when we have the app up and running, we should have that capability on the phone to make available that you can take a snapshot and it automatically sends that information as well as you having to fill out a few pieces of information uh, to get it. What, what a, at least this is a sort of a, a stopgap measure right now. I love to get a photo of that rose, uh, symptomatic, and the name of the cultivar of that rose. And if it's one of interest, we will tell you to send it in. Then the question is, how do you send a sample in? Uh, you know, some of these roses are thorn, has thorns. Not all of them, but some, most of them have thorns. So you want to use really thick plastic bags, uh, which the example I have over here, this is, I think, about an 8 mil or 6 or 8 mil bag. Um, or double bag it in a Ziploc. That's just to prevent potential spread of the mite, uh, that if it pops open, the mite is not going to get out. Uh, do not add moist paper towel or moist paper in the bag. The biggest problems that we do find with samples coming into the clinic is people think we have to keep the samples fresh so we have to have some sort of moisture in there. So they put a wet paper towel in there and that will just encourage a lot of other saprophytes and other opportunists to grow during transit. So the ideal situation is do not add any additional moisture. If there is a little bit of moisture in there, it's okay to put in some dry paper towels to use as absorbents. Um, mail it in a crush proof box. You know, sometimes the FedEx box or the priority mail box is great because it prevents things from crushing. Because anytime you get crushing effects, you get release of plant juices, and which is moisture that a lot of other fungi uh, can utilize or even bacteria can, can utilize. Uh, overnight it to us 
if possible. Uh, and, and I just threw that, that address up there temporarily. Eventually this will all be done through a, a phone application. Um, and, and by the way, don't just send samples, email us first. And we'll tell you if we want the sample or not. If we get a sample in with no other information, we will not work with it. Unless it looks really, really cool. <laughs> um, now, there are a lot of different things that I could talk about in terms of why we do what we do and how we do what we do, but apparently I'm running out of time, so I should quit right here. Because what time are we going to get Giannis on? Oh, as soon as I'm done, okay. So I'm going to quit right here. Um, I'll take a few questions. Uh, but again, I want that dress from your daughter in College Station. She destroyed the plan. She still got it. Excellent. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you one thing, too. We had a couple of uh, 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 situations in College Station where we thought, and I would send people out there because I want disease in College Station because when it's there, that means I can actually bring disease plants in and do work on it. <laughs>